Welcome everyone, I'm Jeffrey Goodman, Director of Marketing and Development for the YMCA of Northwest Louisiana, and we're here at 318 Latino Studios for Shreveport Bossier, my city, my community, my home. And it's not every day that I get a guest like today's guest. Our guest is Larry Clark. Larry, thanks thank for you. being here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Thanks for making the time. I know you don't have much, but thank you for being here. <laughs> I have a lot more lately. <laughs> Well, let's tell everyone a little bit about you. Um, Larry, you've, you've had an incredibly productive and successful career, and I know there's still much more ahead for you. You were, among other things, you were the dean of the College of Business at LSUS from 1985 to 1994. Yes. Then you returned to Shreveport, where you served as the chancellor of LSUS from 2014 to 2023. Correct. So let's start here today. When you arrived back at LSUS, it had an enrollment of, and I'm going to say this slowly because I want people to hear this. When you arrived back at LSUS, it had an enrollment of 3,810 students. In 2014, yes. Fast forward 10 years, and for the first time in school history, enrollment has surpassed 10,000 students. It has. So start, if you could, today by telling me the story about how LSUS got into offering online programs, which are one of the keys to its growth and to its unprecedented success today. Sure. You know, uh, coming back in 2014, uh, things had changed a lot. And uh, I'd been gone, as you say, for 20 years. And when I left in 94, there were uh, 44,450 students, and they all were face-to-face. And uh, for the most part, that's a, who they were in 2014 as I started the fall semester. But fortunately, uh, Paul Sisson, who had been the interim chancellor, and uh, the faculty leadership and the academic uh, leadership of the university had agreed to start uh, moving a few programs to online. And they could not have chosen a better partner to do it with, with academic partnerships uh, out of Dallas. And when I uh, got to Shreveport, uh, there were not many students in the online at that point, but uh, I had been nine years with school dean here before I'd left. I was all total at two more universities, 28 years as a business school dean, 29 years. actually. So I was ready to be able to do something with seeing a lot of schools. Uh, uh, had a chance to see over 30 business schools in the accreditation process. and look to see what could we do with the MBA to really try to differentiate when we were going online and doing something very, very different and uh, be effective. And there was a, the faculty was terrific. Again, it could not have happened. If that wasn't in place already when I walked into the door, uh, we could not have launched the way we did. But we were in a very, very tough financial situation. My first faculty meeting in August of uh, 2014, I talked about the possibility of filing financial exigency where we start to lay off tenured faculty. That's how bad a spot we were in. Not today. And when you say if that were not in place, you're saying those particular faculty members, if they were but not it would have, there? It would have taken too long to try to get in place. I had to get a letter of credit from LSU to be able to open it. I borrowed $100,000 from the Noel Foundation before I actually started my first day to help to cover the expenditures on the first day of my being chancellor. And the Noel Foundation uh, chuckles about how they lent me that money before I actually was even chancellor. Uh, it was a tough situation. And that was the start? The, uh, July 2014. And that was the start, the very first online? Well, the, and the online had started in the year before, but okay. it was just starting. But, okay. it, but again, the, everything was set with the company. Academic partnerships was perfect. Uh, the programs that were set up were uh, well done by the faculty and how they got engaged. And uh, they had done the right approach. Uh, not to try to replicate military correspondence course type of online, which many online programs still are today at universities, but to make it a more dynamic process and how it's done. And uh, that was fortunate. And that company, tell me the name of the company? Academic Partnerships. And that's still... In no. So along the way, LSU Online was created to take over that role. And so now, uh, and what it does, they're involved in... Uh, trying to solicit students for the program. And so they handle the uh, the front door, but then the processing all still happens at the LSUS campus. Okay. Then all the decisions are made for who's admitted, who's not, who stays in the program, who does not, all that's done on the campus. 
But they're no longer involved. No, today. no. So LSU uh, decided to bring that home and to do it. Uh, we were paying money to academic partnerships for uh, them to do that for us. And LSU uh, saw a need to try to uh, integrate other online programs as well within LSU and do it that way. We were not uh, real enthusiastic of the idea initially. I, I'm glad to say that uh, it's worked out well. Yeah, well, that's a remarkable growth uh, from 2014 to today. So it is uh, huge. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, again, and it's, uh, I, I say thank you on behalf of everyone at the university who was involved in it. It clearly was not just me. Again, some things were set before I got back. Absolutely. Well, you you hit on this a little bit, but in preparing for today, uh, I've spoken to you about your 29 plus years of involvement with the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business, or AACSB. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, the, the Business School Accreditation Body for the International Accreditation. And so my question for you is, talk to me a little bit about what you noticed in your over 30 different university reviews uh, that was different than when you arrived to LSUS in 1981, and that's still different today. And what are some of the factors you attribute this to? So, as you say, I, I originally came to LSU Shreveport in 1981. And uh, incidentally, when I came, uh, at that time, Forbes magazine had, had an article that talked about the cities of the future of the South. And they included Charlotte. They included uh, the fact of Birmingham and some other cities. Uh, and uh, Shreveport was right there in the top five or six that they thought by the year 2000 would be um, just amazing. And uh, bad luck happened. A lot of the manufacturing that ended up off, ultimately going overseas or being discontinued with GM plant. But coming back to your question, the, uh, so when I got here in 81, uh, there was not housing at LSUS. Uh, graduate programs had just begun. However, there was a provision that was put in that said that if you did not have the accreditation uh, that was in that area, you couldn't keep your graduate program. At AACSB, we got it in 92. I became the dean in 85, left in 94, but in 92 we got accredited. We were the second smallest public university in the country to have AACSB. And so we were under a lot of pressure to get it. And there were those who were, quite frankly, uh, weren't encouraging us to get it, but uh, or hope that we might not. But the thing that, that's different is I got to see these schools. And again, uh, I didn't. I had over um, thirty schools. I worked thirty universities, and I uh, didn't go on campus to all of those, but I did to many of them, many times chairing it. And you walk on the campus, and there would be the pride of that community for that university, and also generally for the business school as well. And the one thing I that's been true of LSU Shreveport since the get-go, is the fact that they're, the, the level of community pride is different. Uh, if you go down to Natchitoches and think you're going to say some things about Northwestern State that are derogatory, you better have your facts straight. And you better be right. And you better be ready to say them real quick because you're not going to get a long time to say it. Uh, you go to Ruston. Uh, but wherever you would go. And the community, the regional pride was there. The legislators would be there. They don't do that with AACSB any longer. But at the time, they would have the community event that was associated with it. And you'd see every uh, uh, legislator or someone who's important, they'd want to be there. They, they, you know, they'd be insulted if they weren't invited. And, you know, that's something that LSU Shreveport has never enjoyed. And it's, um, it's kind of strange in how that is. Uh, but it, in parts, it goes back to the roots of when LSU was formed, how it was formed, what happened at, at its formation within the community in the region. And so... And tell me a little bit about that. Well, in 67, LSU decided to put uh, a campus on. They'd already put one in uh, Alexander and Eunice and put one in Shreveport. And the idea was to be a uh, sort of the hub being the Baton Rouge campus and it'd have so that students would start at Shreveport or Alexandria, Eunice and transfer down to Baton Rouge. And the model didn't work very well, but there were community colleges. But when they announced in 67, then immediately the Southern University System decided to open up a campus on the, in Shreveport, which is Susla. And Bossier Parish decided that they were going to do something, and they created grades 13 and 14 at Airline High School, which is the predecessor to Bossier Parish Community College. And so what you had was three competing uh, community colleges beginning at the same time. And there were still some 
pushback within the community. There was Centenary College was clearly the college of choice for many of the people who would, uh, uh, the more academic elite, uh, but it was also sometimes seen as more the socially elite. Uh, and then, there, of course, you had uh, Louisiana Tech, Northwestern State, with proud alums and, and the thought that, why do you need a university in Shreveport? What's its mission? What's it going to do? And, and so, uh, and then there was LSU itself, who, you know, whether or not they really wanted a strong public university or not. And so all those play. And, uh, you know, it's uh, when coming back and it's still the case today. Uh, you, you just don't see the community turnout to the public university of, of Shreveport uh, and of this region. I, I don't say it's in Shreveport. I don't say of Shreveport when I'm normally speaking because it isn't just of Shreveport. It is, in fact, Northwest. Um, but it is a reality that uh, you, you just don't have the level of embracing of LSU Shreveport as a public university. And so what it meant was, as we were figuring out a business model, for what we were going to do when I came back in 2014, part of the reason to go online in such a significant way was that we knew we couldn't get money from the legislature. Um, LSU gets around $13.5 million today on 10,200 students. Uh, back when I came, it was around $9.5 million, something like that. So you surely, and the budget today is $81 million. Uh, as I left last year, it was $32 million when I got That money that takes up the difference, the delta, is money from online. It's from all over the country, sometimes over, around the world, where that money is coming in tuition, which made the difference. And uh, that's what was able to make it possible for LSU to do what we were able to do. It was the, uh, the student tuition dollars. But I do wish that there would be more. And I, and I mentioned to you uh, offline when we were talking that uh, when the new head of the Southern University system came to Shreveport, and, I, and he's a former business school dean like me, and I happen to, to have had uh, uh, dinner with him, uh, with our spouses at, at, before he got his job, before I came back. And so I went to see Dennis be there. And all the local legislators were invited to Susla for the event. And only two legislators showed up for a new system president. Where were the rest? It's not a white-black issue. Where were the rest of the legislators? It just doesn't happen. I guarantee you, if something happens at Louisiana Tech, if it happens at Monroe, if it happens at Natchitoches, they're there. That's just something that is a, is a quirk of this area, but it's also sometimes, you know, I think, and I think we're getting off uh, track, no, but I think, I think it's a problem that, that this community has, I use community in the broadest sense, not just Shreveport, sometimes has, where we uh, differentiate based on race, based on socioeconomic, based on which side of the river you're on, whether you're a Republican, hard Republican, Democrat, what you are. Uh, it, it's the need we, to come together it, more. We don't see it as, we don't see it as, this is our community, all of ours. It, that's right. That's, and, and we see that probably more at LSUS with many of the students that we get who feel like this is uh, a different Shreveport for them. And I go back, I shared with you that uh, in 81 when I got here, a student asked me, we under, I understand you're supposed to be pretty good, if so how come you're here? Yeah. And it's kind of like, gee, maybe I made a mistake. Here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe I made a mistake. And what do you what do you attribute? I have kind of two follow up questions. So, like that apathy, talking about let's say the legislators not right. showing up for yeah. uh, to welcome the the new dean or the new chancellor, the new, the new president of, of the new university. Um, what do you attribute that that lack of support or? I don't know because individually, uh, the legislators are all. Are terrific, and I will say to their credit, uh, a year ago, the last couple of years, we had invited the legislators to the what they call the barracks uh, there, opposite the uh, the state capitol, and uh, all but one made it. One had a, a a reason for not, but they all were there. They came uh, there, uh, but they. It's not that legislators come in and want to know what can we do for you. It's the other way around. We have to negotiate with other different kinds of needs and things. And part of that is because of how the state funding works. And, and there's so many that are asking for uh, resources from the state, and the state's budget is, is uh, constrained. So it's a different dynamic. Okay. It's not that there's a, uh, it is not a case of being against, it's just a problem of trying to get together to be able to have enough more to, to move forward. 
Which brings me to kind of the second thing. I've had people on this podcast say there's kind of, we're in a zero sum game here or there's Uh a scarcity mentality. You know, do you feel like, um, you know, Bipsy opening at the same time or soon thereafter when LSUS opens or Susla opening? I mean, does that play into well, this idea? What, what happened was there was a missed opportunity. You know, Cedric Glover uh, was pushing in 2012, among others, for and continued to, to merge Louisiana Tech and LSUS. And uh, in many ways, that made no sense. You know, you have two business schools. How do you merge those? What I think would have made a better merger still do, and I publicly have said it, talked to our faculty senate about it, was merge us with the LSU Health Science Center and then have one much stronger LSU rather than LSUS and LSU Shreveport Health Shreveport. You know, we get mail back and forth between the two universities. Who are you? Who are you? Uh, you know, make that, because then you would have not had, uh, you could have, ideally, I think, on the LSUS campus, you would have had undergraduate and master's level move allied health onto the uh, LSU Shreveport campus, take advantage of the extra land out there. So you take off some of the pressures for uh, space on King's Highway and then put the doctoral programs and the uh, uh, medical uh, health programs at the uh, postmasters there. But uh, that was not favored by anybody. Uh, and I even mentioned that uh, the spring of, uh, I guess, 20. Two or something in a meeting with President Tate and six or seven Board of Supervisors members, and they were not at all interested. And I asked the question, are you concerned about having a strong LSU in Northwest Louisiana as competition, potentially, if it evolves right? And of course, the answer was no. And do you, I mean, as you look ahead, I mean, you're kind of, I mean, you have a little distance from this now. Do you, do you, do you think that could ever? Uh- well, there was an opportunity, because what had happened was there was, a, there was an opening, uh, because Dr. Golly had uh, stepped down, and I was coming to the end of my arc of being a chancellor. And so I suggested it as a possibility that I could step down early, and uh, they would have an opportunity with two chancellor positions to be open to, to merge at that point. And again, I, in all seriousness, I did talk with the faculty senate and my team and talked about what could be the possibilities of that. And it takes away from the, continues to be, uh, and we have to do a report each year for the Board of Regents based on the 2012 uh, commitment plan, which would have been a merger of us in Louisiana Tech about different things. It's kind of like, you know, we're looking, we don't want to be looking back at that. That's it's a historical event. You know, it didn't happen. Let's look at what we're doing and be focused on the future. That's where we want to go. We want to go where the hockey, the hockey puck's going. And, but to go back to that, I mean, you don't, do you see that merger between the Health Science Center and LSUS ever being a possibility looking ahead? Well, I would hope it would be a possibility, but I don't think it's a probability. Okay. I understand. Well, during your, chi- during your time as chancellor, um, obviously much was accomplished. Um, cutting edge places for learning and research have transformed the LSUS campus. I'm going to name some of them, including the Centralized Student Success Center, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Idea Space, Cyber Collaboratory, Pilot Education Center, the Human Performance Lab, and the Veterans Resource Center. Yes. So what I'd like you to do is, you know, I, we've had people on here talk about um, how abundant maybe in challenging the different issues and problems we have in this community are and how you had to kind of eat uh, the elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> so my question for you is just for someone who is highly functioning like you are and who tackled a lot of things during um, your time at LSUS, talk to me a little bit about the process you used during your time as chancellor for prioritizing your different initiatives? What we try to do was what's popular today is look for the white spaces. Look where there's need within the region that are not being met so effectively. And uh, one of the things that you didn't mention, because it's not a physical thing, but is the uh, support of nonprofits and what's called INR for us and what we're working with with that, and Heather Carpenter, who's phenomenal, who we've hired in during my time. So there's, uh, you mentioned things, but there's also some people that are not in a thing uh, in the programs and what we're doing. But, you know, we looked over at Louisiana Tech, and we didn't need to try to replicate. We could not. Louisiana Tech is a damn good university, okay? The engineering programs they have, the cyber cyber work that they've done in cyber engineering is is top-notch. Um, they have a great business school. I hired their dean, Chris Martin, uh, when I was business school dean at Shreveport. Uh, I have tremendous respect for him and what he's doing. 
Uh, I love what they do with the Fenway Group and others in terms of having both engineering and business students working with companies there uh, in Ruston on the campus for things they're doing. And so they were doing a lot of really good things. And uh, uh, same could be said about at the uh, LSU Health Science Center, Allied Health, a number of things. So we look to see where were those potential openings and what could we do to work with it. And that's why we went with a cyber collaborator and we were working with Barksdale and there were some, some amazing things that we ended up doing with Barksdale that uh, uh, allowed us with the technology that we were utilizing to do things that couldn't be answered, quite frankly, by uh, other universities. And, and, and how, does, how does one, how do you, how do you come to find a white space? <laughs> if you're blessed, as I was, you have someone as a vice chancellor like Julie Lester, who was very, very good at looking to where the hockey puck is going to go. And uh, she was our, one of my vice chancellors. But it was also just the innovation and the ideas of asking faculty to help in terms of what do you see? Uh, and oftentimes faculty will see things, but that's not going to happen here. Well, what if it did happen? Uh, I think if you look in the back of campus in the health and PE building, what happened there with uh, the human performance lab. And uh, we wanted to be able to collaborate better with LSU, LSU Health Shreveport. And so often we'd be going over and say, we'd like to collaborate with you. What have you got? Well, we don't have very much. Well, what are we supposed to do with you then? But we created that center over there, which is amazing. And so Coe Cohern, unfortunately, who's left us and went over to there, uh, it's like what happens in uh, football and basketball today with the great athletes going to different schools. But Corey still works uh, with the, what's been set up. Uh, but the atmospheric chamber that's there is now it's still not operating, but we have a, the, in, the auxiliary one there. But the program and what we do with, with heat and impact and things like that, and the ability to get grants and do, working with fire uh, departments all around the region within the state. Uh, the, you mentioned the idea space. Uh, we had uh, a faculty member spend two different summers at Stanford for what they're doing. It's based on Stanford's idea of how to approach. And I was a speaker in Charleston, South Carolina, and to a group of business school deans as chancellor um, back about four years, pre-COVID, a year before COVID. And uh, the person from IBM talked about the fact that they were adopting the Stanford model. That, again, is what we call idea space, but it's their model. And they said the difficulty they were having in finding business schools that understood the model, other universities who understood it. And a speaker there was from uh, New Orleans. We were in Charleston. Uh, and I said, do you know that we have an idea space lab in Shreveport? And she says, no, I'm talking. I said, I, said, I know it's, not, it's called idea space, but it's based on, and that we had the person that you talked about for being what's driving IBM today in decision-making a process was our commencement speaker a year ago. And she said, you're kidding. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden the lights went on. And so that was in a faculty initiative that started with uh, an interest that he was picking up on the West Coast. And from that became a physical space. And from also, from interaction with that came a commencement speaker, the guru. And I know you're, I know you're a big fan of SWATs. So yes. yes. for those out there that don't know what that is, SWAT is SWOT, stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. That's so right. Put me in. Let me let me just hang out with you okay. uh, during a, a SWOT analysis of, of of something. Tell me what that you know. Paint a picture of that process okay. in that room and what that looks so, like. So, um, in Drew Lester's office was a big wall that was a whiteboard, and on that whiteboard was everything that we were looking at going out five, ten years, and they were in how we'd work within the community, what we would do with expanding our face-to-face -face students, which continues to be a, a very important matter for the university to, to become more successful at. Uh, but all aspects would be there. And, uh, you know, we would look at uh, some of the competitors again. But, uh, you know, we were, we were looking are at... We, are, is it, is it, are we looking at four quadrants, like when I go... So on? it isn't. It's a little bit of a modified one. It's, it's not a traditional SWAT. Uh, Julie was from England. Uh, she approaches things a little bit differently. And, uh, but it laid it all out so that any time that we wanted to do something, we could go in there, and I happen to be taller than Julie, and so I could go above where she could reach, and I could draw an arrow down and point with a question mark or things like that with it, uh, of which she would get a chair and 
you take it out. But anyway, uh, but it allowed people to go in. But what it also did, it allowed us to recruit people. And we hired some well over 200, 225, maybe 250 people at the time. And we grew a lot. And so we would bring people in that were key people, bring them in the office and say, here, look at this. And where do you see in terms of things that where you could fit, what you might think to do? And they might tell us what they do. And the one thing we sold, which is why I came in 81, I came here in 81 because I was sold on the possibility of a, a you know, the, we began as a community college in 67, LSUS did, it's 14 years in. And they were looking to really try to step up and do different things. And again, the Forbes magazine's talking about the possibilities that are going to be here. So there's a lot of opportunity. In 81, are you still in community 81. college? And so, well, no, we were four years by that time, and we now okay. had an MBA. When did it become four? Do you know? It became in, I don't. Okay, I should. sorry. Uh, but it is in the mid-70s. Okay. But the, the fact is that when looking at these, I came here because of opportunity in 81 and the possibilities. That's what we kept doing the recruiting because we went for, you know, 10 years before I came back hiring very, very few faculty. So you have this gap. You had people who have been there a long time. A lot of people were insistent that they'd left. And then you had some newer, but there was, that's been a challenge at LSU Shreveport. And we hired so many faculty. But it was the opportunity to have junior faculty. And you say to them, you could come in and you could be uh, a key player. You have an opportunity to do something. You could do this. And they'd look and say, well, I don't know. And I'd say, I did an 81. You could do it now. It's, it's pretty similar in terms of the setting. Different, but pretty similar. And there's opportunities. So we sold the vision and those who might want to, to catch the vision and, and whatever the vision might be, but saying, how can yours fit to this? You know, if you've got something, bring it to the table. We'll figure out a way to connect them. Let's see what we can do. But so that's really what we were doing the whole time. And what made it possible was that our uh, graduate programs, primary graduate, uh, that were on, on online did really, really well. And we became damn good national leaders in online. And we became it because we had a different way of approaching online classes. Uh, we uh, much more involved by how students engagement within an online class. So we really uh, came out with a whole different way of approaching it. And it was very, and it is, continues to be very successful. But it was, you know, a chancer can't do that. A chancer can want it. A chancer can dream it. Or likely you wake up in the middle of the night thinking that's never going to work. Can it? But you don't show that face. And, and lo and behold. But you can, you can build the team or, or recognize the, the people around you and the strengths they well, have, we didn't and, have. We didn't have and, any money for me to hire people in when I, was, I came back in. We were on, uh, ready to possibly file, file for financial agency. So we had to do it with the team that was there. And the team that was there had to come up. And again, I gave them credit, and I'll give them credit again. The faculty had already made a decision to try to do something with the online, and they chose right with academic partnerships. So the bet had already been made. I doubled the bet, tripled the bet. And, and having been a business school dean helped because of where we were going with our focus. But again, none of that happens if it hadn't begun. And, you know, uh, things have been very slow at LSUS, unfortunately. And, and, once, and again, they came through not being merged in Louisiana Tech. There's still the hangover of that in 2014. That was in 2012. And so seeing success and then saying, hey, this is, this is pretty good. But we were redefining it. We were no longer trying to define it based on a face-to-face -face campus enrollment, of which we still were struggling with and continue not to be where we want to be. But we we're in a new arena, and uh, we chose to go into that arena that no one was doing. And so you have, you know, today there's more... Students graduate at the uh, more graduate students graduate from LSU Shreveport than any other university in, in the state. There's more African Americans graduate from LSU Shreveport at the graduate level than uh, than either Southern University or Grambling, and you can almost put them together, and it's still more. So it's uh, you know it's the faculty, the staff. I mean, it, it's we do registrations 14 times a year. We I'm not there. But they do 14 t different times. Back in the day, you did it in fall. You, know, you had fall, spring, summer one, summer two. Everyone had to change. Everyone had to change. And in the middle of all that change came the what? Pandemic. The pandemic. And we had to move and, and operate out of our, uh, you know, of our living rooms or uh, extra bedroom or things like that. For four months, we weren't there. And uh, we still 
grew and managed it out of that and doing an admission decisions out of kitchen on kitchen tables amazing yeah it's amazing so i'm gonna leave this swat discussion in just a second but just my last question on that so this whiteboard that was in julie's office mm -hmm. it was just this this <clears throat> chart or this 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 visual stuff that she's right it stayed up all, the all time. okay well she and i were there together yeah love <clears throat> and she now is the head of the uh texas state university campus uh at round rock and so uh she left just after i did unfortunately but um uh, but she was great. But the good thing is, you know, I I am couldn't be happier with the job that Bob Smith's doing. Robert Smith is doing a great, great job. And there's some terrific people that are still there in team. He just did a new hire. Uh, Julie's position has, has changed some by what how he's going to be doing certain things. Uh, they just hired a new vice chancellor who's terrific, a new police chief who's outstanding. I mean, the, the hiring of really outstanding people is continuing. And uh, I've got to tell you, um, I believe Bob Smith's doing a, a great job. I couldn't be happier. Could not be happier. Love that. And we had him on here. And I saw the, been I saw very uh, impressed with everything I've seen and all no, my interactions absolutely. with him. Absolutely. All right. So um, we're going to zoom out a little bit. When you first arrived in Shreveport, you didn't know a single person. Correct. And you said, this is a quote from you, you said, a way to get to know people is to get involved. <clears throat> Yes. And in your time here, you've been deeply involved in so many different aspects of our community. So my next few questions are going to focus a bit on your civic involvement. Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you're one of only two citizens that were on both the biracial commission and the black and the black white communications task force. Yes, that's correct. The black white communications task force preceded the biracial commission, but that's correct. Okay. And. We've discussed the subject of race relations a number of times on this podcast. Uh, in, in my opinion, this is Jeffrey speaking, in my opinion, race relations is one of the areas of our city that is hindering us and holding us back. I would agree. So my question for you is, what are some recommendations for change or action items you would suggest as we look to build stronger <clears throat> race relations in our community's future? So the biracial commission <clears throat> came about because of the fact that there was a, uh, an incident in Cedar Grove. It got overplayed at times at, during the day in the late 80s of saying a race riot. It, it, it wasn't to that extent. But there were uh, one or two people died that night. And uh, Mayor John Hussey created the biracial commission to take a look at race relations within Shreveport and make recommendations. And there was a report that was created uh, Lydia Jackson, before she went on to become a state legislator, uh, she was uh, the editor of it. Uh, those of us who were, there were three uh, committees of the Biracial Commission. I chaired the Jobs and Economic Committee, uh, subcommittee. Uh, so each of us had a part of writing it and working with it as well. And so the Biracial Re uh, Commission report was issued. And, and to orient people, just year-wise, we're talking late 80s, is that that's correct? That's correct. That's correct. And the, uh, it covered all aspects of, of the community life. And it talked especially about some of the social economic issues of the time. And uh, there was talking about the need, which even issues today of the, the pre-K issues for education, uh, adult illiteracy. Uh, looking at one of the suggestions was uh, to try to have uh, Votech and uh, Susla and, and Bozier Parish Community College working uh, so closely together in terms of helping to create uh, support for jobs and uh, new business to, uh, creation. And so there were a number of recommendations that were in it. Unfortunately, uh, the report was issued and, and happened uh, towards the middle to the latter part of John Hussey's uh, term as mayor. And uh, when Mayor Hazel Beard came in, and, and Mayor Beard had been a student of mine, not mayor at the time, in 81, 82, my first year, I had her for two classes and got to know her. She was a non-traditional student, older than I am. Uh, and so I got to know her. Uh, and I was hopeful that she would do something with the Biracial Commission report. Um, there was a recommendation for uh, Economic Development Office and Business Development Office, and she created uh, Economic Development Office, had Dale, Dale Sibley uh, take that position, and it was a, a, a good hire, a good, um, a good step. But unfortunately, 
um, it sort of got ended up on the shelf. And it continued to be on the shelf, and it never come off the shelf. And the themes of it were the need to have much more integration in the socioeconomic issues. Uh, you could look at it and read it, and quite frankly, it would seem like it was written a year ago. And that's the sadness to me of the fact that there was something put forward for the community that could have helped the community more effectively, hopefully, deal with some of those issues and work with them. And instead, it became more convenient to put it to the side. And uh, there were issues, and, and uh, the issues got, quite frankly, to be with, between Lydia's father versus other uh, black political leaders and their differences, and it became uh, some of the white business community who didn't like uh, her father, Alphonse Jackson. And so there are, there are always different reasons why not to do something, which has often been a problem, and versus reasons to come together to do something. And I've heard you talk at other times about um, a vertical approach versus a horizontal. Right. Explain what that means. So I think bit. that one of the problems is that when you do something like a biracial commission, in of itself, is, a, is sort of a vertical. You're going to look at, at race relations primarily. And the recommendations made by the Biracial Commission talked about expanding across, dealing with the socioeconomic issues across a, the wide span, and the need for uh, support for small businesses, the need to help people be prepared to be small business persons, recognizing that manufacturing was uh, being undermined and uh, by outsourcing. Uh, so there's a lot of things in there in, in, the, in the K-12 issues that were discussed that uh, go across the verticals. They, they, are, they, are, they integrate within the community. And I think that's one of the things that got lost was that it wasn't that emphasis of trying to do things across uh, the different uh, socioeconomic uh, issues that, that exist didn't happen. And, uh, you know, I would hope that one of the things might have happened now with the focus that we did, uh, when I was a business school dean, we at one point had eight full-time people working on outreach. Foreigner Small Business Development Center, Jerry Hatcher headed up our advanced manufacturing with three full-time people, and we had a full-time person doing um, our economic research. And so eight full-time people. Uh, today there's one person. But we knew there were other people doing that when I came back. We needed those business back and all at the front line for our, our immensely expanding online programs. So we went that way. But looking at the not-for-profit, Shreveport's very fortunate to have a large number of uh, strong not-for-profits. And we thought that if we could focus on trying to help uh, link them better together, that that would be a very effective way to deal with some of the problems that don't need to be handled by a governmental entity, but need to be addressed. And so I think what I, we were hoping was that the city could provide some support dollars, some uh, uh, help to be a catalyst, but not necessarily uh, should it be the one that's being the, would a commission work? So when, when Mayor Hales of Beard, Mayor Beard told me in her, that she was not going to keep the biracial commission, she discontinued it. And some said, about time, good, great. Some are disappointed. I, I said, that's okay. I'm not one that says that. It really was a vertical. Now, do things that will help to spark activity in the, across the, the different ways and, and, and help to have with small business entrepreneurship and help with the K-12 issues, help with some of those other kind of things. That didn't happen as much, unfortunately. And talking about the nonprofit, just to be clear to everyone, even though we've talked about them a number of times on here, so the 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 outcome or result of that is the formation of INR. The so it already was in existence before I got back too. Okay, and and it's been uh, worked very well. Helen Wise has directed that program, and it's very very amazing. Back the person, just amazing. She's a associate vice chancellor, amazing person. Um, so it was in place again. Things were in place. It was then let's let's take them up at a higher level. Let's let's put a real strong commitment behind it. So that was there. It's not my creation. And that's some of that's some of Einar's goal is to connect these nonprofits. Absolutely. And then being so fortunate to hire the right people in, and we did. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So another common topic on the podcast, as you know, are the low self-esteem issues many people face when claiming Shreveport as their community and home. Um, 
you're extremely positive about Shreveport and one of our city's very best advocates that we have. Um, so my question for you is, what do you see when you look at Shreveport that so many others struggle to see? Well, you have to be realistic, and you also have to be uh, looking for opportunity. The realistic is we still have lots of challenges, and a lot of those challenges have occurred because we did, get, did not get serious about addressing the issues that I just was talking about that were uh, laid out in a biracial commission report. Those issues still exist, and if anything, it's gotten more difficult because of uh, so many of the jobs have gone away. They're not there, and uh, so the level of poverty has uh, further increased. So I think, you know, I come back to what I mentioned uh, about the student my first year in 81. If you're so good, why are you here? Um, it was a white student from Southwood High School. Uh, his seeing the community was different than a black student. He was white. It was different than from a Bird High School student who was uh, honors, you know, coming from a better uh, social economic situation where they were going to look to what to do. He didn't see much of a role. But if he didn't see much of a role, in what was then known as Cooper Road area, Martin Luther King, how are they going to see a future? And so I think that investing in the youth, investing in the families and, and the things that the not-for-profit are doing, which is why we thought that was so important at LSUS, is really critical. It's really critical. You cannot just say that the city of Shreveport is an entity can solve it. It can't. Uh, that's the schools can't just solve it alone. That's why I love what's being done by the, the community foundation and uh, the leadership that's come from there for trying to work with the K, uh, pre-K. Uh, terrific. So I think it's, it's being realistic to look at what are the issues. The crime issues are very real. Uh, and then you have to deal seriously with those. And you also have to try to see where can be some opportunities and try to make it so that people have a reason to see if they fit in and they have a place. Love that. And then lastly, after I asked you this question, we talk about it, I'm going to come back to you and see if there's anything else you want to hit. But lastly, you're chairman of the Shreveport Capital Improvements Committee, a, a committee that was formed to help determine what projects should be prioritized in the 2024 bond referendum. Yes. So what can you share with us about this process? So I feel like I ought to get out at this point because I'll be talking about this because the mayor has... This is from, actually, one of them I still had from when he was there for his inauguration. I'll put on, I love Shreveport, so I'm more official in responding back to that. So, uh, yes, so Mayor Arsenault uh, thought that I might have some time on my hands as I was stepping down and asked me to uh, chair the Citizens Committee. And so we looked at uh, uh, way, well, well over $350 million of possible uh, needs and, quite frankly, had the bond referendum recommendation at 350 there still would have been a number of important things not in that it's at 254 million uh, a very very significant high number but there hasn't been a comprehensive bond package passed in the city since 2011 in 2019 uh, there was a total failure and in 2021 uh, one proposition passed on public safety and so there's a critical critical need and one of the things about how people feel about how they live in the community is based on what do they see when they look around within their community, and especially where they are. And uh, there is just a, a, a tremendous need to address some infrastructure issues within the city. And even some of the buildings of the city of Shreveport, have, that they've aged and they, you know, some phenomenal uh, facilities. But, uh, you know, Cyport is not the side part of when it opened. It has lots of needs into it. And so there would be some that would say, well, why can't you take that with normal maintenance? There should have been more normal maintenance. But the fact is the budget didn't allow it or the priority wasn't made. You have to deal with the reality of what the reality is. So, you know, the the thing that was really important was that the of the uh, 19 of us that were chosen, and each city council person uh, put up two people, the mayor put up uh, six people, as one of them the mayor put up, uh, we went out into the community. We had four community meetings. We had a Saturday where we spent um, over five hours on a Sportran bus riding around, looking at neighborhoods, seeing streets. And I should say we felt streets because a Sportran bus going over a bad street, you feel it. Uh, and I think it was important to get into the community 
and see and give people within the community a chance to come forward and talk about what it is that uh, doesn't allow them to do what they feel they ought to be able to do to be to to enjoy being in the community. And we knew as we went to the community meetings, the four of them, that there would be people come forward, and their issue wouldn't be one about a bond issue as a capital item. It's one a major project, but it would be more about mainly a drainage ditch that didn't work or a potholes that weren't fixed. And so I love the commitment that, that uh, Tom Dark, the CAO of the city, and uh, the mayor had there all the uh, heads of the departments for the city. And when people would start talking about that, I would, and I emceed all four of them, to say, you know, we have somebody right here. Or call on Tom Dark and Tom would introduce and say, make sure, see that person after the meeting, go over there, talk to him. So we were able to do that as well. But I think it helped greatly for us to give people a chance to be heard and allowed us to come back. And, uh, you know, the, the committee was amazing. There were people there uh, who I knew beforehand, many that I did not know. Uh, but to have them talk about their community from what they see or need and why, um, I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm really, really happy that each city council person is holding a town meeting and talking about it. Uh, the mayor is out doing it. He chose that he wanted to do it, not have the committee be the sellers. We were involved in creating the prioritizing of the projects and putting it together. He wanted to take personal responsibility, and I think the city council members are. And I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, I kind of would have liked to have been involved still with it because I want to be involved. But I love the fact that we're not in the sense that uh, the council members are taking responsibility, talking about it, and the mayor is, and I'm hoping that people vote and vote yes. Well, Larry, those are all my set questions today. I mean, you've lived such a rich life and, <laughs> and done so much during your time here. Is there anything else you want to share or say? We have all the time in the world, so don't <laughs> feel pressed or pressured. Um, but this be where some of the friends of the university say, stop, stop, Jeffrey, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is no. Thank you. I've enjoyed the opportunity of being here. I do watch. I've seen a number of your uh, podcasts that you have done. I think these are, are, are good for the universe, uh, for the community, uh, allows the community to get uh, other ideas and be shared and not into the small sound bites that often are forced in an in evening news in a 30-minute time. So I think, it's a, I think it's great that what you're doing, uh, making these opportunities available for the community to learn more about some of the issues. And so, you know, I uh, thank you for inviting me to join you. I've enjoyed being here with you. And uh, let me go back and say again, uh, you've asked me a lot of questions that I answered individually, but you understand it was a team effort that did what we did at LSUS and continues to be a team effort. And I couldn't be prouder of the team for what they're doing back there. And I purposely, you know, I've been on campus uh, six, seven times since June. I purposely have stayed off campus. I did not want to be there. Uh, I don't uh, send suggestions. I uh, stay out of it. And, uh, but I could not be prouder of what they're doing and what's happening. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very optimistic for things that are going to be happening for LSU Shreveport. Find your pride in the community for LSU, but also for BIPSI, for SUSLA, for others, uh, LSU Health Science Center. Uh, you know, recognize this community has some great educational and Votech here as well. Amazing things being done t today uh, with it. Uh, take pride in those entities and support them. Be proud of them. Well, I'm proud of you and uh, feel very fortunate to have you here today and just here in this community. So thank you. Thank you very much.